Thank you for having me. So I have no conflicts. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my goal is to show you a common patient scenario, move into why we say what we say, what's on the horizon, how do you look at your general patients as far as screening, and then show some future options. So Mrs. Smith had abdominal pain over the weekend, went to an emergency room, had a CT, and guess what? She has an ovarian cyst. So what goes through my mind as the radiologist is I start to ask some clinical questions, which I may or may not have the answers to, and unfortunately, you may receive a report that says correlate clinically, which we all try not to say because we know that's obviously what you're doing. <clears throat> So my questions are, how old is she? Should she be ovulating? Is this a functional cyst or a tumor? If the woman is in her menstrual years, this could very well just be a functional cyst, something we almost expect to see. Could this be the cause of her pain? Why did she go to the ER? Does this lesion need more tests? So here's our ovary, just to remember what's going on every time a woman ovulates. So she's developing a follicle. It's filling with fluid. If this gets disrupted in any way, then she'll develop a functional cyst, a follicular cyst. After ovulation, she has a corpus luteal cyst, another cyst we might see on imaging, which is totally normal. It's also something we may see during early pregnancy. So we do use size to help us best guess which type it is and also the clinical history. So there's a relationship to birth control, just to think of in the back of your mind. Someone who's on high dose oral contraceptive pills will have suppressed ovarian activity. So we're less likely to see a functional cyst in a woman who's not ovulating. If she's on progestin only or the mini pills, she's actually more likely to have a cyst because that disrupts ovulation. Also, the hormone-secreting IUDs will also have the effect of increasing the likelihood of a functional cyst. Some other things which may help us in the history is if she's on tamoxifen. There is an increased risk of ovarian cyst formation. If she smokes, did she just undergo a cycle of IVF? Did she stimulate her ovaries to make more follicles? Is she on HRT? People of increased BMI can have a more frequent occurrence of ovarian cysts. But some important things to remember is that having cysts does not increase her risk for cancer later in life. Also, if a benign cyst is removed, she also does not have um, a decreased risk of cancer. By removing the benign cyst, by doing a surgery, does not decrease her likelihood of having cancer later. So this is the ACR algorithm, and I know this is a busy slide. I keep it on my worktop all the time because it can be hard to remember the numbers, the sizes, and when you follow things up. This is what your radiologist can provide to you. This is for people who've had a CT or an MRI, meaning that we maybe didn't see the ovaries as well as we could have, and to decide when do we want to order an ultrasound to evaluate it further versus ones that can just be let go and assumed to be a functional cyst. The ACR appropriateness criteria will be helpful, but the overall theme is that an ultrasound of the pelvis is your go-to tool, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. The ultrasound probe is close, and so we're able to see excellent resolution of the ovaries. Sometimes an MRI pelvis with contrast will be appropriate, especially in larger lesions. Part of our size recommendation comes from the fact that on ultrasound in a mass over seven centimeters, we can miss a mural nodule. So that's when the MRI would come in with contrast. A few concepts that I think is important to discuss is that aspiration is not appropriate of ovarian cysts. When that does happen, it can lead you to be falsely reassured that it's not cancer, even when it is. I've seen malignant lesions that were aspirated, unfortunately, and the fluid was benign, but it was cancer. CT is usually not appropriate to follow up uh, a, a cyst in the ovary. Um, CT is excellent for someone with ovarian cancer because their disease likes to coat the peritoneum and it's a quick and easy test. 
So sonography, no radiation, very low risk and a reasonable cost. Some of the more recent publications show excellent sensitivity and negative predictive value by using ultrasound. Some of the details that your patients may ask you about, uh, we can look transabdominal. We always do, just in case there is a mass that extends beyond the true pelvis. That would be too far away from a transvaginal probe for us to see it. The transvaginal study is usually required. Um, not everybody's tiny so that you can see the ovary well transabdominally, and the transvaginal probe allows us a good assessment of the ovary. Doppler is just a feature of the ultrasound that helps us to see blood flow. A simple cyst, these are often functional, and expectant management can be possible in them. So now let's go into a population that maybe we're a little bit more worried about. The postmenopausal woman. She shouldn't really be ovulating, although spurious ovulatory events do happen in the early menopause. You still have to think, well, this could be a neoplasm. So in a simple cyst in the ovary who is greater than 50 years old, I realize not everybody's in menopause by that, but for this study to get enough people, these were included. In the cyst less than or equal to 10 centimeters, most of them still resolved. And the risk of invasive cancer was less than 1%, less than 0.4%. So this is maybe a paradigm that helps us move forward in the way that we look at ovarian cystic lesions. In the UK, there was a similar trial um, with the same outcome, less than 0.4%. So our consensus opinion is that simple cysts do not need immediate surgical evaluation. Referral to a specialist is probably indicated if this cyst persists, follow-up may be appropriate, although ACOG is also slowly coming to this as well. In a low-risk patient, the recommendation is an initial three-month follow-up and then every 12 months for five years. Serial sonography does decrease the number of operations done for benign conditions, and that is one of our goals. So when a cyst shows internal hemorrhage, it has a characteristic sonographic appearance. This is a hemorrhagic cyst. We have slightly different follow-up recommendations. It's never normal in the menopause, however, and that should prompt referral. And then there are other characteristic cystic ovarian masses that have a very prototypical appearance on ultrasound and should be easily differentiated. Ovarian neoplasms can be benign or malignant. There are also some in between, just to keep it confusing for us. The low malignant potential lesions are often handled by an oncologist. Serous cyst adenoma is the most common cystic lesion in the ovary. It's benign and not considered precancerous, but it is a neoplasm. When these do degenerate into cancer, very rarely, it is a low-grade cancer. High-grade cancer develops de novo. So our, my key concepts are that in expert hands, ultrasound is highly accurate. Having an expertise with the subject matter is important because you have to remember what the relevant questions are. Excision of cysts is still the definitive tool, and any concerning features, which should be evident by the imaging study, should prompt referral to a gynecologic oncologist. Just a brief statement about serum biomarkers because sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. CA125 is the serum marker that we use for ovary cancer, but it's extremely nonspecific, and young women, especially with endometriosis, will have elevations and cystic lesions in their ovaries, so then it becomes very confusing and scary for the patient. There are some other um, laboratory tests that have been proposed. Most of these are for use in people who have a known mass who are going to the OR to help stratify who goes with an oncologist and who goes with a benign gynecologist. <clears throat> there are several scores that have been proposed. Some of them include imaging, and so I will discuss them here. So the RMI is a risk of malignancy index, and you'll notice that the calculation of it 
does have ultrasound. You get points for menopause and you actually use the serum level of the CA125 if drawn. The ultrasound, if it has no features suspicious of malignancy though, is zero. So you're multiplying by zero, therefore you don't have a risk of malignancy index greater than one. And so that can be kind of a helpful score, realizing where ultrasound can play a role. Why don't we screen? So there was the PLCO trial in the United States, and we basically found that the risk of ovarian cancer mortality was 1.06, and so survival was not significantly different in either arm at 10 years. There was no reduction in ovarian cancer mortality. The usual care group was just having doctor's visits and not the annual screening with CA125 or transvaginal ultrasound. So our current stand on screening for the average risk person is uh, not advocated in the United States because drawing yearly CA125, it's so nonspecific, and ultrasound did not decrease mortality, and the false positive screens had associated complications, usually surgery, which can, with a surgical complication for a benign mass is not the best scenario for the patient care. So the UK also did a similar trial with a lot of patients, and they talked about the harms related to false positive surgery, effective screening on disease mortality, and the psychological morbidity associated with the screening. They used an ultrasound screening and a multimodal screening paradigm. The first words that came out about this was there was no difference. But eventually, at the 7 to 14 year mark, the multimodal screening paradigm did show a overall mortality reduction of 20%. So this comes into the future. What might be lying ahead for us? This is the paradigm that was the most uh, efficacious for them. And it started with CA125 and moved on to a transvaginal ultrasound with a specialist. Why do we worry about ovary cancer? I know we all know the terrible statistics. 90% are epithelial in origin. And the problem is that we don't detect ovarian cancer until stage three and four usually with a terrible five-year survival of 17%. However, if you could catch ovary cancer early, stage one, there's a 92% five-year survival, but only 15% of patients present this way. And this usually occurs on the incidental finding on a CT or MRI done for another indication. So we got to temper that with the fact that in the United States, we do 9.1 surgeries per malignancy of the ovary detected. In the UK, in a, in a, um, in a cancer center, that's 2.3 surgeries for every cancer. And in a non-cancer specializing center, that's 5.9 surgeries for every cancer. So ACOG does say that most postmenopausal women will require surgical intervention. But I do believe that referral to an expert sonologist because we can distinguish a benign lesion from a, a malignant lesion is of high value. So the future does hold centers of excellence, people who are familiar with the topic matter and can ask and answer the pertinent clinical questions. Contrast enhanced ultrasound like Dr. Diaz discussed, I think this may be something we use in the future not so much to look at the ovary, but maybe to look at the tube, because we do realize that almost all epithelial ovarian cancers come from the tubal origin. Currently, there's no standardized terminology or risk stratification. Um, there are attempts at it, so maybe it will be coming kind of like BIRADS to be more user-friendly. Thank you.